The hair is doing bits, but you know what? It's part of the vibe. It's part of the vibe. Hello everybody, Jean here. Um, welcome back to the channel. It's been a long time since I've made a video and honestly, I have just been exhausted. I've been tired. I have been a little burnt out. And about a month ago, I started animation school. So very exciting. Um, and this week we just finished our first module. So very exciting, very relieving. Um, I feel like I have a little bit of time to myself, even though I really don't. I wanted to make a video today specifically about the portfolio process for um, the National Film School or IADT for animation. Compared to like a lot of other animation schools, it's a bit of a one of its one of its own. It's uh, she's a mysterious girl because she really is very vague. If you have looked at the portfolio process for IADT in general, it's kind of vague compared to other colleges and so when you're putting it together if you are putting it together yourself or even if you're in a PLC it can be difficult to know what you should include and what you shouldn't include but I thought I'd make a video today just talking through my portfolio process showing you guys the pieces that I put in talking about the things that I did to get into the college first time um, and hopefully this video will be helpful to you guys there are two other videos that really helped me when I was um, preparing my portfolio and that was Alva Fearin's portfolio um, video and Amber Amelia's portfolio video. And I'm gonna link both of those in the description. They're both still current students and I talk to them often enough inside of the college whenever I get to see them. Another thing I'd say is if you find an animation student on Instagram or on YouTube and you're like looking for more info for tips or whatever, do not be shy to like send anybody a message or a text because we're all super, super nice and it was too difficult for us to get in. So if you have a question, we are not going to be like, oh, I'm not going to answer your question. So if you have a question, send it in and like, we'd be happy to talk to anybody, literally. So if you find literally anybody in animation, don't hesitate to send them a text if you're like, oh, I don't know how to do this or I'm not sure about this or what do you think of this? I used to harass the students even before I'd met any of them. I like followed them all on Instagram. I'd send them text messages about the portfolio, specifically Alva. So don't be shy. This video is going to be lengthy in general, so I am just going to put little timestamps down below so that you guys can skip around the video to the points that are most relevant to you. But I do kind of just want to try and cover all the bases in this video according to like my experience so that it's kind of helpful to you guys. This isn't supposed to be like a short, fun video. This is supposed to be informative, so, you know. The first thing is what is the purpose of this portfolio? The purpose of this portfolio is really to show them your range of skills and process. I think like process is like a massive theme throughout first year in general, but it's really something that they look for in your portfolio. So as much as they're looking for finished pieces and your ability to, you know, draw a body really well or paint really well or all of those skills, they're also looking for like your ideation as well. They're looking for your ability to be able to not just draw a character, but like, how are you going about doing that? Do you know what I mean? Are you just sketching one and then being like, mm, that's fine? Or are you like, no, what if I did this or what if I did that? And you're like making a few variations and you're playing around with the themes. And like, this is all stuff that you will learn in first year and in like in animation school and in general. But specifically speaking for the portfolio, especially like in your sketchbooks and stuff, they really want to see um, your process. They want to see how you think because that's what they're looking for. They're trying to figure out who's going to make a good animator, you know, and as much as they could tell that from a finished piece, they can't really. So it's important to give them as much scope as possible by showing your process. And you can do that through finished pieces. You can do that through sketchbooks. Um, you can through, do that through how you display that. And we'll talk about that later. But I'd say that the overarching theme for the purpose of your portfolio is to create something that shows process and it shows how you work and it shows your creative workflow that's specific to you. I think that's like the overarching theme, along with good drawing skills and um, good draftsmanship and good use of color and all that good jazz. The next thing that I want to cover is PLC versus doing it yourself. I personally did my portfolio at home and the reason I did that was because I didn't want to go to a PLC. I didn't want to have to be going into somewhere every single day because I was working a lot of the time. 
and I also just felt like I knew what I wanted to say thematically with more with my portfolio and I kind of knew what I wanted to do and I feel like I'm a pretty independent worker in general so I I didn't I personally didn't think that motivation was going to be an issue for me which it wasn't this is you know people who generally go for animation love the love what they do and me just kind of being pretty independent since I was young I was like there's no point for me to go to PLC I'll do it at home just for me it just worked out better so I think the biggest thing is like weighing it out and seeing what works best for you I have a bunch of friends who went and did PLCs and they found it to be an amazing experience and it really helped them to get in and create portfolios that they felt really proud of um, but it just wasn't the right fit for me learning and longevity I think the biggest thing about creating a portfolio by yourself or even if you're in a PLC but I'm going to be talking specifically about your personal work and like I did mine at home so I'm going to be talking from that perspective is the learning process and how you learn and really upskilling yourself and then also maintaining a certain longevity when you are creating the portfolio. So the one thing that I'd say that not to get confused with is the portfolio is like an extremely lengthy process. Like creating an, an in-depth portfolio is quite, it takes time and you are creating a lot of work. The one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to burn out before you finish the portfolio. It's bad enough burning out once it's done, which has happened to the majority of us, but burning out before it's even complete is just not a great thing because there's really nothing that you can do to, you know, relieve burnout, but just let yourself work through it. So I'd say as much as you're working hard towards this goal, make sure to give yourselves breaks. And in terms of your creative cup, make sure that you're refilling it often enough so you know you're drawing you're you're outputting a lot of you know creativity on the page but refill that creative cup by listening to music watching movies going outside going for walks and going to museums looking at things and um, taking photos one thing that i found that was really helpful is um learning new artistic skills because you know it was something new for me to try it was something different and it was exciting it wasn't mundane yeah so i think meaning a good longevity throughout your portfolio process is really important and learning to find a balance in your life and that's only something that you can do but the health aspect is super important because you need to stay healthy mentally and physically in order for you to make good work you know exercising or trying to at least even going for a walk you don't have to be running or like you know going to the gym all the time but like those things are really important for artists too you know we use our minds very like a lot we use a lot to create new things so we have to be a little bit on top of our game and taking care of yourself is really really a big step towards that we're going to start talking now about putting together your actual portfolio and for me when i did my portfolio it was online and i have a feeling that it's going to be the same this year um because the, it just works really well it's really easy you can just upload all your stuff online but um i'm going to talk you through like literally every single section and how i approach each section and i might give you a little few snippets of parts that i did The first part is your CV. They look for a CV in your portfolio. The CV is really only things that are relevant to the animation course. Your portfolio is proving to them why they should put you in this course. There is literally like around 30 spaces inside of the course and they have taken in less people this year than the years before. And so this year I think we have 33 people. Maybe next year there might be less. You have to prove to them why is it that you deserve to be in this course? Why do you deserve to be in this course more than anybody? And you have to show this through everything that you do, right? Like that is, a, that's a key part of this entire process. So I think when you're putting together your CV, don't put things like you did like some work experience at a shop or something. Like even though the skills that you might've learned through customer service might be transferable because you know, you're working with people, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. I think, um, they want to see things that you've done 
that relate to the art field. So for instance, I was employed by the shop that I work at to paint a Christmas mural on the window. So that is something that I could put in my CV because it like, it relates to art. It's something that I did. I got a brief and then I completed that brief and I was paid for that brief. And it doesn't have to be that big. It could be like you worked at a summer camp or you know, whatever the case may be, something creative. Find the creative things that you've done in your life. And um, even if you have to pull them out of your ass, do and try to write this CV in a way that is professional too. Professionalism is a really key point of this as well. I think as creatives, we're used to just kind of being artsy and being whatever, but there is a side to animation and uh, to the whole film industry that requires, um, you know, a little bit of sensibility and thoroughness and common sense as well. So for my profile, I put this. Jean Elescabessia, I'm an aspiring visual development artist, although who's to say that that might change dramatically over the next four years. So there I'm already kind of like saying, I'm getting in. And I want to be a visual dev artist, but by the end of my four years, I might not be. So I'm a, this is already like a pinned focal point for me. My goal with my art is to create environments, objects and characters that aid in telling new stories and bring beautiful ideas to life. I am a hard worker, a fast learner, and I'm very self-motivated. Don't play yourself down. A CV is like a really good place for you to, um, you have to sell yourself a little bit. You do. And it's not a full of yourself thing to do. You want to get in here. This is your goal. So like do, you know, sell yourself well. Like if you can learn things fast, say you're a, a a fast learner if you care about what you do then say that you are very motivated and you like to do things to the best of your ability that's not like a full of yourself thing to say and i think it can be hard to like dig deep and do that if you're not used to doing that i had to kind of get a little bit of push from the people around me to like really go in and be like i'm a fast learner i'm a hard worker and do all these things because i'm not used to telling people that i don't walk around the street being like by the way <laughs> i can do this you know what I mean? Like, that's really not, you know, and I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. Then I say, over the past year, I've been constantly taking online courses in digital painting, environment design, drawing skills, anatomy, and color theory. I was previously trained for eight years in traditional fine art skills, watercolor drawing and acrylic. So I definitely think this course would provide me with opportunities to further my knowledge and experience in the arts, specifically animation, and provide me with the skill set and contacts needed to start working in the industry. That's it. It's like a very short paragraph that explains a little bit about me um, in my CV and why uh, this course would be beneficial to me and also what I have previously done. And then I list a few things like the Christmas mural I did, some freelance icon designs I did, some commission work I did, and then a little bit of my education that relates then back to the art. So it's your school education, but then I took some art classes on the side. Your CV doesn't have to be lengthy. Mine was like a page and a half but use your words wisely and use them carefully. The next is your personal statement. Your personal statement, you have 800 words. Um, and these 800 words is kind of your pitch, is how I like to think of it. It's kind of, there's 30 people here. They all really, really want to do animation. They all are really, really good at art, why are they gonna pick you for for that class? Like, what is it about your experience and you as a person that differs? Because you can draw as well, and you both are like good with art, and you both really, really want this. Like, you guys want this so, so bad. So why are they taking you? You know what I mean? Why are they taking you versus somebody else? I think this has to be a little bit logical because when you're writing your personal statement, I don't think the best route to be is like, I've wanted to do this since I was five years old. I've wanted to be an animator. And even if this is, and even if that is true, I think you need to write it in a way that feels really specific and unique to you. So it doesn't come across that you're just like, I've wanted to do animation forever since I was two, and now I'm here. You know what I mean? You need to put in specific life experiences, like specific shows, specific moments that really molded you into person that you are and that caused you to get to this point now where you feel like this is the right fit for you and this is the next step that has to happen in your life 
um, because all your life has been pointing to this moment. My personal statement was a bit of a, a counter argument a little bit in the sense that I basically spent the majority of my personal statement talking about how as a kid I was doing things that were very related to film stop motion, filming little movies on my iPad, being um, obsessed with like behind the scenes of film and stuff like that. And then as I got older, I just disregarded my art and film um, and my all those things that I loved up until the age I was like 16, 17, I just disregarded that and went to study physiotherapy. So I built this whole like basically argument that that's not the right career path for me and then brought in what actually happened, which was Physiotherapy didn't work out because I was meant to be a creative person. And that wasn't something that I could try and hide. It wasn't something that I could shy away from. I have to be creative. And animation was that perfect mix of drawing and technology and videography and film that brought me so much joy as a child that this is what I have to pursue. Like, there's no way about it. I actually haven't talked to a lot of my classmates about what they said for their personal statements, but there you go. There is some of mine. I will, yeah. I might put a little snippet on this screen here for you to read. Okay, your sketchbooks. Sketchbooks, um, you can submit one sketchbook, you can submit two sketchbooks, you can do whatever feels right. Um, the people at IADT, one thing that you really need to understand is they are very nice and they are also very, understanding and chill and they're very introspective I would say as in like they're not going to fail you because you didn't exactly have four to five pieces of artwork or you didn't have exactly you know this thing or that thing or whatever it was they will be able to see the artist within from the work that you put through but it is still good to try your best and try to present stuff that, um, you know, sends the message that you are a, a, a good candidate for this course. So with the sketchbooks, that was, I think, one of my personal downfalls in uh, my portfolio process. Number one, because I submitted two sketchbooks. One was a gesture and anatomy sketchbook and one was my sketchbook. And I tried to make my personal sketchbook look like those YouTube, Instagram sketchbooks where it's like every single page is perfect and every single page is yada yada, this, this, that, the next thing. And while it was a very pretty sketchbook and still to this day, I'm very proud of it and I'm very happy with it. And it's got a lot of lovely stuff in it. It really didn't show any growth because it was only finished pieces. There was not a lot of process. Everything seemed curated and nothing seemed like I had sat there and I had been ideating and creating and developing and developing. It was just very much like I searched up a few hands, drew a few hands, then I drew a character and it was just all very finished, you know? And I think that that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for finished with process you know what i mean so if you're saying doing a, a character design of let's say i don't know a skateboarder you could do all these skateboard designs and you could design a bunch of panels for the back of your skateboard and then you could work on the character designs you could um write little notes about like what you feel like because he's this he's got this kind of character and this kind of behavior that he's that's going to translate into his with the way he looks and the shapes that you use to, to build him and to create him. And you could do that over the span of like five, six pages, you know? And then at, on the sixth page, you have like a finished piece of this character design. They would eat that up. They would eat that up. They would inhale that. They would be like, oh, gagged. Like they would live for that. You know what I mean? That is the type of stuff that, that would really get them going. And they're like, oh, there's one professor that is like literally one of my favorites, Laura, and she gets goosebumps all the time whenever she sees work that really um, moves her or that she just loves. And if she saw all that process, she would be like goosebumps. Goosebumps. So I think process is key, don't forget it. And so is gesture and anatomy. <laughs> this is not a joke. I know that a lot of people 
maybe shy away from it because it's not as fun. I personally absolutely adore life drawing classes in college and they have made me improve so much. But when you're at home and you don't really have access to life drawing and you're just like looking at your iPad and you're trying to like do like 30 second sketches, it's not as fun as like being in like a life drawing class. But with that being said, I think having a large part of a sketchbook or even an entire sketchbook dedicated to life drawing and drawing things from life, i.e. going to the park or even searching up pictures of animals online and quickly sketching them, things like that, just bring a little sketchbook with you and a pencil, that is a really, really good thing. And I think that that should be a focal point, if anything. So if you feel like you're not, you don't have the time to put together like a, a sketchbook that shows a bit of you and like a live drawing sketchbook, I would like focus on a live drawing sketchbook or a drawing from life sketchbook because it's, uh, it's definitely something that would be necessary, I would say. Are we good so far? Cool. Let's move on. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is your actual pieces. Um, the pieces of artwork that you decide to put inside of your portfolio. So, this is a tough one and I'm not gonna try to generalize in this because I think every person has like a different way that they format their uh, portfolio stuff and specifically the pieces, right? <laughs> the pieces. I think there's a limit on how many pieces you can do but once again, they're not specific for you to reach that goal or if you go slightly over, they just, I think one thing they did say, say in the project day, it's not about a large volume of work. You know, you don't have to submit like 40 pieces of art or 30 pieces of art. But like, if you submit five that are your best work, that's maybe a little bit better than submitting 25 pieces of just like mediocre to shit work. You know, where you were just like, I just need to get work out and I need to do more work. My portfolio, I broke down basically into two sections when we're talking about the finished pieces. I did a, a part of them digitally, and then I did a part of them traditionally. Um, and for my digital ones, I really focused on environments and some few fun character designs. But the one thing that I really wanted to push with my digital work was color. Um, color is something that I love. I just love color so much. Um, color is like, my baby, I love color so much. I love lighting and stuff like that. And I just wanted to try to get really good at it, which I wouldn't say that I did. I would say that I improved, but we all know art is a very, 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 very long journey. And so I think with my portfolio, I merely scratched the surface of my improvement and, you know, my progression in terms of my art. Nevertheless, though, I took quite a few online courses some were from Domestica, some were from Udemy, and one was the digital painting course by Austin Bachelor, I think, on Udemy. The other one was cinematic illustration in Photoshop with uh, Izzy Burton, who's literally one of my favorite artists. There's also a book by, uh, I think it's 3D Total, um, called um, The Beginner's Guide to Procreate. If you are painting on an iPad, get that book because it has so many little projects that you can work on and step-by-step -step guides into digitally painting. Because let me tell you, uh, painting on a digital device is a little bit different from painting IRL and that transition can take time. But when you, if you're, if you're just figuring it out for yourself, if you do put in a little bit of money and you get a few courses, they're not super expensive. A lot of them are often on sale. Trust me you will improve a lot quicker than if you were to just sit around and try to figure it out yourself. And they also give you like little fun projects and little briefs to work and that will give you then work for your portfolio. So I often enjoyed doing the courses because by the end of finishing a course, I'd have like five pieces that I could put towards my portfolio. I also did Inktober where I did like all these like little IRL ink sketches, some were like of rooms, some were like of little characters, and a few of those made it into my portfolio too. Um, so I just created work from like a lot of different areas. That year I was at home and I was working and I decided to get a scroller box subscription for like six months or something. 
and that gave me like new art supplies uh, that I generally would never have bought or like used before and that allowed me to like try out different techniques and so I would create like really fun pieces with that as well. Not all of those made it into my portfolio but they were fun ways to explore the artistic creative side from myself and let go from the things that I usually create. When I went into the traditional side of my portfolio, um, I also took a lot of courses specifically for painting animals in watercolor. I took a specific course which was animal illustration in watercolor on Domestica. That was a super, super, super fun class. I think it was by an artist called Sarah Stokes. Um, and it was so much fun fun like so relaxing and I ended up putting in my horse and my cat that I painted that I'm still really proud of to this day from that class um, and I learned a bunch of new techniques that have really helped me with my painting and my layering and my color theory and working with color IRL versus you know digital stuff um, and so like I just felt like I learned a lot from like all of these different courses that really helped and aid in pushing my work a little bit further on. You know, it, it's a little, you know, every <sighs> animation school is a little subjective. Just because you make solid work doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily like that. And there could be a variety of reasons for that. You know what I mean? I think one thing definitely that let me down with my digital was it was all very stylized in my style, which isn't a bad thing, but working in the animation industry does call for you to be very versatile. So although that my traditional stuff did show that I could pull from realism and stuff like that, I think it would have been handy for me to put in some stuff that maybe was a little bit more realistic or maybe more cartoony. Ah, oh, this one is one that I feel like like people just don't care about. Like unless it's like a point of interest for you personally, then people just like don't give a shit about this area of their portfolio. Like a lot of people that I talked to were like, I just kind of threw this together last minute. However, that's not gonna be the, the advice I'm gonna give you right now because I do think it's worth taking the time on and I wouldn't suggest like leaving it to the last minute because it's actually really fun. And that is storyboarding. <laughs> storyboarding. I can't remember what's the specific amount of like storyboards they look for. I feel like it's like two or something. Storyboarding is going to be like a key part of animation anyways. You know, you're going to go into this course and you're not just going to draw finished pieces. That's not going to happen. So you may as well try to just like use your portfolio as a, like a time to like get a taster for different areas of things that you might be doing once you get in. So storyboarding is like a really cool area for you, you know, because we all have those ideas of like, I read this book and it got turned into a movie and I hated the way that movie ended. So storyboard the way that you think it should have ended. You know what I mean? Oh, like I have this idea, like what if da 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 da, storyboard it, storyboard that idea. Like if you have an idea for that film, storyboard that idea, girl. I took this course on Domestica. It was storyboarding for something. I don't know, I'll link it down below. And it was so helpful. This course was intensely helpful and I learned so much. And I didn't really put all my learning into the, my, my final storyboards because I just, I was running out of time. So it was kind of like very like, oh, I'm throwing this together like very last minute. But I think that mm, that course definitely informed some of the choices that I made with my storyboard. So what I did for my storyboard was I submitted one basically storyboarded scene. Um, I had read, finished the Chaos Walking series and I then watched the movie afterwards and I was so disappointed with the entire film, but specifically the ending because the ending of the trilogy is so much more gut-wrenching and heart-wrenching and emotional and uh, evocative than the movie was. And I think that the movie ended as if there was going to be a second movie, but it was just pretty much a flop. So I decided that I was going to write my own little script based on the ending of the book, like if it was to be transpired to film, and then I was going to storyboard that script. And that's what I did. So. The whole point of storyboard is to be very sketchy and very loose and not worry about things being necessarily super perfect, especially because the version that I did was like 
a super rough pass like that would just not be acceptable literally anywhere but i think that the people who were looking at my portfolio would have gauged the fact that i was telling a story and there was enough panels to get my story across i tried to use different angles and even though i don't think that i displayed a very broad knowledge of storyboarding or basic storyboarding i think that they could have gotten the gist that i was trying my best and that um, i was interested in the subject because i had put a little bit of time into it um, and I would suggest the same for you guys. You know, you don't want to ever submit your portfolio and then after be like, oh, I actually just wish that I tried a little bit hard on that, on that last bit. Like, it's one of those things, it's the same as school. Once it's over, it's over. But you never want to look back wishing you could have done more because you kind of just, you have that one chance or you'll have to do it all again. So just try your best, you know? The next thing that I want to talk about is burnout. We talked about this briefly at the beginning of this video. Burnout hit me severely after I submitted my portfolio and the same for a lot of my friends in first year. I couldn't draw. It got so bad to the point that I started reconsidering other courses because I thought that I generally had just, I just was like overdrawing. Like I, that phase of my life was done and I just wasn't into drawing anymore. Like I could not pick up a pencil. I could not look at a sketchbook. Physically could not draw. Like you could give it to me. I just wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, I spoke to one of my mentors um, and he was like, you are experiencing uh, burnout, you know? And that's a, it's a very normal thing to experience. And then he proceeded to give me some tips on how to prevent it in the future. But really, it comes back to just like taking care of yourself, not overworking yourself, understanding what the what is a good balance. And also, if you're tired, you're tired, right? If you're not in the mood for drawing right now, then don't push yourself. Pushing yourself or pushing yourself to be creative is not really a positive thing. And we all have to do it at some point. We have deadlines, we have shit that we have to do. So, you know, you get to a point where like, not pushing yourself is not something that's really an option. It's kind of inevitable. Just try to maintain a healthy balance. You know, a portfolio, you're not really in college yet. You know, your deadline is if you start a year before or a year and a bit. I think my portfolio took me like a year and three months or something. I really hope that this video was helpful. I hope that like talking to you guys about my experience with my portfolio could help you a little bit in seeing a new or another perspective for um, creating a portfolio. I want to say if you are watching this video and you are an upcoming uh, National Film School student, um, an animation student, um, good luck, all the best. We will all see you next year and be very excited to meet you guys. Um, and if you have any questions at all about not only the portfolio but like other things relating to art don't hesitate to text me um i really enjoyed this if you guys did find this video useful definitely um subscribe and leave a comment down below and even like this video all the resources and stuff that i've mentioned during the video will be linked down below um, and i will see you guys in the next one bye